All right, guys, so I figure it's about time to do another little little axing video. Some people tend to find this tricky. Really, the key is just to have a little bit of patience, get a little bit of practice in, and you know, be consistent with your strikes. But today, we're just gonna ax out a little, little eating spoon, maybe pocket spoon size, a little bit bigger, I guess. And we're only gonna need a few things to do it. You need a pencil, unless you got a really good imagination and uh, can visualize it without lines on the wood. A piece of wood, obviously. I'm gonna use a template, you can choose whether or not to. Um, a folding saw, I use a silky gomboy. And you're gonna need an ax. And this is the Swedish carving ax by Granfers Brook. So, I will start by moving this stuff aside and just getting rid of some waste wood. This is the top of the log here, and if you carve it bark up like this you'll get concentric rings in your bowl depending on where you want your bowl which I'm looking and I probably want it at this end so I'm just gonna knock off anything that I know I don't need take it down to less than an inch thick and that's pretty quick just want to form this into a rough billet this is maybe seven eighths of an inch thick maybe maybe about an inch thick and you can choose to completely flatten off the surface that's up to you i like to just because it i'm able to draw on it better I tend to get more consistent um, designs drawn on my billets if i square them up and make sure they're nice and flat so again, I'll double check the ends to see which end's got more meat on it for the curvature of the bowl. I'm gonna go with this one, we'll see what happens. Also, you wanna keep in mind, are there any knots? Are there any funky spots? I got a knot right here that looks like, if I'm careful, will totally be carved out in the axing process. So I'll bring this pretty much to the edge of my billet here. And I'm using a Sola KB24 pencil. These work great on wet or dry things, so naturally they're great for spoon carvers that carve green wood like myself. I, uh, despite what is popular opinion, I like to leave a little bit of excess on the end. Worst case scenario, if there's enough excess on the end, like if there's an overabundance of it, I can take it off with the saw later on. But I find that the, the tip of the bowl during the axing process takes the most shock out of all the, out of the entire spoon. And to have a little bit of extra meat there definitely can't hurt. Okay, so that's a basic spoon drawn on there, nothing special. Come right up against that line. And if you go a little bit past it, that's totally cool because you can make this smaller later on. This is kind of a big, bold um, spoon anyways, so we can kind of bring that back a little bit later on. There's nothing to worry about. And part of the, the joy of spoon carving is just being able to um, improvise as you go. If, if it was a, you know, if it, was supposed, if it was supposed to be perfect every single time, you know, we'd all be spoon carvers, and we wouldn't be so excited when we get a great spoon. We wouldn't be so disappointed when we get a failure. So what I'm doing right here is just creating what's called a stop cut, because I'm gonna use my ax to cut down to this cut here. So starting here and moving down. And from this end, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna start here and move down to that cut, which will give me a basic Nike swoosh symbol, if that's the way you want to look at it. It'll be a, like a check mark symbol, or shape rather. So I'm gonna pretty much erase everything that I just did. And this can be the trickiest part for most beginning spoon carvers or some carvers that have experience as well. 
it looks on camera like I'm cutting right towards myself and like that seems like a bad idea but I have all this material between my hand and the axe and I'm not taking big old swings here either. I'm taking you know short methodical cuts that if anything were to happen I'm gonna either dig into the stump or dig too far into my, my billet instead of my own hand. And you wanna always keep that in mind when you're spoon carving. Like what, where's, where's my strike gonna land if things don't go well? You can save yourself a couple trips to the hospital that way and a lot of heartache. So that's my first cut. And this is all going to get drawn back on. It's, it's not 100% necessary to, to draw that on before you make these two cuts here. Some might say it's a waste of time and that's, that's fine for some, but I like to use it as a reference point whenever possible. already know what you're trying to achieve here is called the crank in the spoon and that is the angle of the handle in relation to the bowl or vice versa and the amount of crank that you want on a given spoon is dependent on the intended use of that spoon if you need something to get into a deep container you're gonna want more crank some people do a hefty amount of crank on spoons just to kind of prove that they can. That's all right too. I've done that myself. Put more crank on a spoon than, than you actually need. And while it might be visually stimulating, it's not always the most comfortable spoon to use if what you're using it for doesn't require that. I'm going to chop off the back of the bowl here. And you'll see me flip it over quite a lot and just kind of check where I have material left, where I don't. Some people will say that that's a waste of time and that during that time you could be, you know, taking another swing couple seconds here and there to check what you're doing is not going to make or break you time wise and if you're going to sit there and ponder over it for hours at a time yeah you could be spending your time more wisely I suppose but there's there's a certain balance you need to achieve in my opinion when you're spoon carving between kind of winging it, going with the flow, and just making strikes and seeing what happens, and being methodical. So here is kind of your basic check mark shape. It's not super thick. The whole thing's probably about 3 eighths of an inch thick, which is going to give me a really shallow keel. I actually probably should have made this thicker, um, but I can adjust for that once I do the knife work. So I'll take off these corners now. And again, there's not a lot of material to take off at the X at this point. Start blending that into a rounded over shape. The idea is to keep bringing your X straight down and pivot your workpiece. That is how you get a consistent strike. That's how you get better at your X work. At this point, I will go ahead and take my template and once again, draw it on there. Making sure it's centered with my billet. And ensuring that it's not moving while I'm tracing it. 
last thing you want is a design that's all skewed and you know there's no turning back. 99% of spoons in my opinion that if you make some kind of mistake 99% of them can be fixed or salvaged in some way um, but obviously there's going to be certain things that that happen or that can happen that uh, might make you lose a spoon and you might have to start all over. So there it is and like I said I wasn't able to get all the way to the edge of my design here which is totally okay because I'm going to end up taking more off up here and making a slender bowl out of it instead of this this kind of fat one that you see here so same thing dropping the axe straight down and turning my workpiece not taking too big of a bite and this is kind of your blind side if you're right-handed which i am is that while you're turning the piece you can't see this side because your face is looking at the back and it's really hard to comfortably, you know, see the, the side you're cutting on when you're doing this part of the bowl. So there is some guesswork involved in it, and it can force some design change if you're not careful. Um, a kind of optional step that you can take here, which majority of the time I do, is to make a cut right here and right here which meet at the neck. And you don't want to cut too deep here, but I'll show you why in a second. So I'm, that shows you, that's how close I am to the neck. Maybe a sixteenth of an inch away. I'm going to keep that on the other side. Again, just by inserting my blade in there, I can see about a sixteenth of an inch. That's about as close as I like to cut it, or else you can end up with a way thinner neck than you originally wanted, and if you're not careful, you can end up with a spoon that snapped in half. All right, so I'm gonna do what's called a drop cut here, keeping in mind that there's a knot here, and the grain direction will change around that knot, all the way around it. The grain direction, it's, it's gonna cup that knot, so it'll start off straight, curve around it and probably go straight again or it might veer off into a different direction entirely. So some of this is guesswork and a lot of it just comes with experience. But you can see how it's splitting, see? And the knot's still going to be in the side of the bowl there. So I got to whittle away and hope the entire thing goes away. And I don't want to follow through my axe strike all the way into this back piece right here because that's how you end up with a hairline crack that will radiate into the back of the bowl. Gentle strokes right here, nothing crazy. Moving the spoon as you go towards that stop cut. And that's that. You don't have to go all the way up to the line at this point, you can. And I've got a little excess here, which I'm gonna come at it from this direction because I can feel that the grain has changed and I don't want it to split out on me. And that's good enough. So we will repeat that on this side. This will be blind to you, but this is where it's easy, easy for me to see what I'm doing. And again, I'm not right up against that line. I'm probably about an eighth of an inch away, but I would rather have to whittle this little bit away than end up going into my handle with my ax. That's probably pretty good. That's good enough. So I've got plenty of meat still left at the top of my design here, which I can do two things with. I can take a folding saw and I can cut that off. Well, I can do three things, I guess. I can extend the length of the handle if I so choose, or I can use up some of that excess to put a finial on there, which is just a little, uh, little decorative touch that to me makes you makes you sometimes want to use the spoon more often makes you want to show it off a little bit more so I'm using the notch here and I'm putting that cut in the shoulder there which will hold it still for me 
probably cut excess off the back of the spoon's shoulders, or the back of the bowl. I whittle a little bit, don't get too close to my line, and then I'll flip it over and do the same thing, and this is the view where you'll be able to see it. See that? Get decently close, but we're not doing surgery here, so anything other than that's not really necessary. You can nip all that off with um, the knife if you're choosing. So I will clean up a little bit of the back here, kind of round it over a little bit more, let it get a little bit thinner towards the tip, which will save me some work with the knife later on. Kind of constantly flipping it around and seeing where do I have material left that doesn't need to be there. Like I said, I'm still just turning the spoon itself instead of adjusting the angle of my strike. And that gives you a muscle memory. Your body just knows how much pressure to put down on the ax every time and you know where it's gonna land and how it's gonna feel. And that's about as far as I need to take that with the ax. So what I'll do is I'll go grab a bag, throw that in a bag, and we'll do another one. Depending on the humidity levels, where you are, um, if it's super dry, you might see something that's only three eighths of an inch thick like this. You might see that crack within minutes. So the best thing you can do if you're not gonna to get to work on it right now is throw it in a Ziploc bag. If it's gonna be a day or two or a few days, throw that Ziploc bag in the fridge. If you're not gonna to get to it for weeks, submerge it in water. Um, I recommend, the way I keep my wood fresh and keep it from drying out, many people know this because I'm pretty upfront about it, um, is that I will take tubs of water, submerge my logs, water all the way up to the top, and once a week I will change the water out and that keeps the logs from um, oxygen getting to them which creates you know a moist environment and stops them from drying out on you which prevents cracking and such um, and actually can help to reintroduce the original moisture that the wood had so it can make it easier to carve than it would have been so i got a couple pieces of wood down here under my stump in a bag and we'll grab another one of those and this is just again this is to keep moisture in it until I can get to it we will use this one I think the wood we're working with today is cherry I have a lot of it right now so I'm not afraid to use it let me pick out a design real quick we'll do something maybe a little bit longer maybe full eating spoon size like Like maybe this one. Oh. The one we just did is this one here that's on your left. And this is the one that we'll be doing, which is considerably longer, at least an inch, inch and a quarter longer. So this would be a full eating spoon size. Um, I can tell right now that the grain's gonna be kind of crazy in this one, which means that my ax work, um, I need to be a little bit more careful than my last one, or else we will be starting over. So I will just kind of square off the face of this and give myself a good surface for drawing a design on. One of the uh, interesting dynamics about wood that is not very straight grained that it will make you work way harder for it a lot of the time. Like I've got grain tear out here because the grain is shifting around this knot. There's also a knot there, there's also a knot there. So this could be a tricky bit to work with um, and that's okay. But you have to be willing to accept that not only might you fail, you might put a lot of time in and fail. You, know, you might 
get all the way to the knife work and then realize that this one was not meant to be. That shouldn't stop you from taking these risks. It shouldn't stop you from, you know, gaining that experience. I get people all the time like, oh, look at, here's this picture of this piece of wood. Should I even bother? My answer is pretty much always yes. I mean, unless the wood is spalted and it's too far gone or if, you know, something is actually wrong with the wood, my answer is pretty much always yes. So I'll square up the sides here. They don't have to be perfect, but I'll take away these thin bits on the edges that aren't usable anyway. leave myself drop my template. I want to leave myself enough meat to where I can get that on there and if I justify the tip of the handle towards this end it looks like for the most part I can probably avoid that knot or I can try to incorporate that knot and hope that it doesn't shrink really bad while it's drying and crack which it probably will so if I'm able to avoid it I generally will unless I think there's gonna be a crazy amount of character in it and to be totally honest, I think we'll be fine without it. So, just as a reference, I'm going to make myself a little line right here. So that I know that that's where I need to go with my axe. got some curve to it that you can either try to work your design around like incorporate that curvature or you can try to do without it and the way to make a stronger spoon is to actually work with that curvature in the wood because that will uh, lend quite a bit of strength oftentimes but as I'm not a huge fan of spoons that are shaped like a question mark. Um, I generally try to get things as straight as possible. So I'm just cleaning up here and getting a little bit of uniformity to my, my billet. Obviously being mindful of where my fingers are. I try to keep my fingers as far back out of the way as possible from my ex because I don't feel like visiting the doctor. All right, so now you can tell with how torn up this grain is that the direction has definitely shifted on me from here to here. I was going with the grain, everything was going great here, and then something shifted, basically, likely because of these knots. So that knot starts here, if I flip it around, ends up here, which probably will cut completely out of our design, which is definitely a positive. So, I will throw this on here. Trace my template. And I don't want you to think that just because there's a knot in a piece of wood that you're working that it's not usable. Even if it's in the handle or in the bowl. Um, I have carved plenty of spoons that had knots in them. You just have to know how to slow the drying in that knot because that knot is where you will lose moisture the quickest 
which means that that wood will shrink faster than everything else and it will most likely crack on you. Okay. Work a little bit more of this before I make my stop cut. And I can see I got a knot back here too. This one's just a little pin knot. I'm not too worried about it. Um, we'll see what happens. I don't expect any problems with it though. All right, we're right up against the side of our design right now. And I can actually stop. You can leave this bit here. I mean, you can hack it off if you really want to. But we're going to go ahead and make our stop cuts. I'm going to saw off the end as well while I'm at it. And uh, we'll see what's, what that leaves us with. In mind too you don't want to saw right at the very very end of your design because what does a saw do it abrades it abrades very aggressively and you don't want the very tip of your spoon to be fibers that are all roughed up um, you want them to still be intact so you don't want to cut right at the tip give yourself just a little bit of leeway we'll do our stop cuts real quick hopefully I'm in frame for that you can see that piece just came right off. Flip it over and do the other side. Every now and then I like to kind of clean my block off so that piece of wood I'm working isn't just slipping around on all the, the mess that I've made. So going back to our axe, do a quick little drop cut. You can see it's going to split right into the side of my handle, but it's not going to split in far. It literally just took the line off. So what does that mean for us? That means that on the other side, we will just mimic that and that's not even a problem. And I can see that the fibers are not cut enough on the back side of this and it's wanting to give me trouble. So, saw just a little bit more. I can get it back in the cut. And there we go. This one's actually trying to split away from where I want it to go. So we will whittle this down a little bit at a time and then drop cut it. That's going to be good enough. That's close enough for me. See if I can take off this knot yet a little bit. See, that's a pretty nasty one too. But I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna pretty much miss it. If not, then we got some decisions to make. stop cut in the bowl here you want to make sure that the distance you've cut into the wood on this side is equal to the distance on the other side because it's easy to cant your your saw one way or another I mean obviously this is an exaggeration but you want it to be even this will make a difference later on Okay. I 
don't recommend a lot of drop cutting onto the tip, but this is all gonna get cut away. The back end right here, I'm gonna be left with that much. So this, I don't really mind if some shot goes into that. Notice how we came from the handle end first. It doesn't really matter how you do it. It's, it's all about getting your routine down and finding what works the best for you. But I will say that doing the handle end first, if this slips out of the cut, there's nowhere to go but the handle itself or my hand. So you need to be a little bit more careful and methodical with your axe work. Remove some thickness from the handle, leaving a little bit thicker of a keel this time. That's where the that's where the strength in your spoon is. The relationship between the the bowl and the handle. You want to leave that grain as straight as possible through there, and the thickness here is what matters. at the end of your spoon and making sure that things line up well. You're better off taking away this material with the axe than once you get down further down the line to the knife. You don't want to have to put that much effort in with the knife. Thin this out just a little bit more. And that's what we're left with. It may seem ugly now, but once you slap a template on there, work around those curves, you'll have something. So line it back up with the existing part of the template that's still on there, making sure that you're even right where this neck is. You want to make sure that you've got equal distance between this side and the edge, and this side and the edge. Hopefully you can see that on the camera. So we will retrace this. A lot of people will say, uh, well, I don't use templates or I don't need templates. And that's, that's absolutely fine. I am somebody who cannot draw to save his own life. And I say if using a template works for you, then use it and do not feel bad about it. Because not everybody is born with the gift of being able to draw or being able to visualize things without them physically being there. All right, so... We don't have a lot to take off here. Start off, work my way around the tip of the bowl. And as your spoon carving progresses, you'll notice that you're more comfortably getting closer and closer to your, uh, your stencil there. I am right on that line. And I'm not like sweating bullets over it, like, oh my God, am I, am I about to cut my spoon in half with an errant ax blow or something? 
I mean, sure, that happens every now and then. I don't want to mislead you and say that they all turn out perfect because we know that they don't. There's definitely some, some risk in, you know, losing some of your work if you're not careful. But that's part of the fun, right? I mean, how much fun would it be if you knew it was going to be perfect every time? Working around the back of the shoulder here. follow through on it and that is pretty good so we've got another one roughed out I mean I could I could get closer to my line in certain spots like right here if I really wanted to I mean it's not necessary but it will save you wear and tear on your knives and it will definitely save you wear and tear on your hands once the knife work comes in But for now, that is all I require. Probably about five eighths of an inch thick here at, at the, the back of the bowl and the keel, um, which does not, it does not need to be that size once it's finished, but it'll, it'll be close to that. At the tip of the bowl, I'm probably about a quarter inch and probably about three eighths at the tip of the handle. These are all loose measurements. This is not, there's not a perfect science to this. It's all about winging it. But I hope you guys have learned something, maybe enjoyed yourself. I know I had fun. I have fun every single time I carve, regardless of if they turn out. Um, and hopefully you guys can drop me some comments or if you got questions, feel free to ask away. I am more than open with, um, with how, how I achieve the spoons that I do. Um, I have no problem taking the time to answer these questions or, uh, you know, share information that I know or, or debate or whatever have you. So, like I said, I hope you had fun and I'll see you in the next one.